This episode of Metatrex is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. There's no greater challenge than the study of philosophy. My philosophy is that there is room for all philosophies on this station. Well, welcome everyone to episode 72 of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy. My name is Mike Morrison, and with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, Zachary Fruling. Today, we'll be discussing our thoughts on Essential Trek philosophy from the second season of Star Trek Enterprise. Zachary, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, although I was getting a little lonely up there in the catwalk while you were out on vacation last week. <laughs> well, that's just getting you back for all that time I spent on that transport to Canamar. <laughs> well, Zachary, I have to say I'm really excited about this because I am admittedly the Enterprise wonk of the two of us. And anytime I get to talk about Enterprise, I'm excited and I'm excited. This is Season 2 of Star Trek Enterprise. We're going to be talking about our essential picks from the season I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Well, you better enjoy it while it lasts because we are running out of Enterprise seasons to talk about. We've done an Essentials Trek Philosophy episode on Season 4 of Enterprise and Season 3 of Enterprise, and here we are in Season 2. It just so happens that Season 2 is actually my own personal favorite season of Enterprise. I know a great many people love the Zindi Arc season, Season 3, but even though I would characterize Season 2 as not being the most philosophically rich compared to the interesting ethical dilemmas you get inside Season 3, I find Season 2 overall the more enjoyable season to watch you more or less took the words right out of my mouth i have to say of all of the seasons of enterprise and thanks for reminding me that we only got four seasons of it uh, this just rubbing it yeah in. just rubbing yeah. it in this season is my favorite season of enterprise and one of my favorite seasons of star trek altogether i think that they really come out of season one super strong everybody you talked about the zindi arc but i think and and this is just based on what I see in discussions on the boards out there as I talk to other fans, it seems like there's a great appreciation for Season 4, probably more so than even Season 3 with the Zindi arc. Because Season 3, it's hit or miss. I mean, you either love the Zindi arc or you hate it. I really don't talk to a lot of people that are kind of on the fence with that. But then we get into Season 4, and that's the Manny Cotto season, and you get a lot of the tie-ins to... Other iterations of Star Trek, this is where they, you know, they bring the Orions in and, you know, there, there's just some of these things that tie into the overall uh, narrative of Star Trek. And a lot of people love it. And, you know, Manny Cotto is a genius and I'm not taking that away from him. But I have to say to Brandon Braga and the rest of his team who did seasons one, one and two, this stuff is genius. And season two in particular is just incredibly entertaining. But Zachary, I have to admit that like you, I don't find it the most philosophically rich uh, group of, of episodes in Star Trek. Season two is insanely entertaining and I love the episodic feel of it. I, I think the writing in these episodes were great. The acting was great. The stories that tell, they tell are fantastic. But there's they, they touch on nuances here, and they, they pull a little bit of this idea in, but they really don't explore anything um, philosophically, that it, at least in terms of, of, of deep, rich storytelling that uh, where, where they really explore. There, there's nothing really metaphysical about it. There's, there's no real you know, deep conundrums or, or interesting tie-ins to, 
really anything philosophical, just little bits and pieces here and there. So that made putting a, an essential list together very difficult. Well, Mike, you know, and any listeners out there who've been listening to Metatrex for quite a while know that I love episodic television because it gives you the freedom to take um, an interesting idea, a concept, a uh, a philosophical topic, an idea, a nuance, uh, an interesting science fiction idea, and build an entire show around that. And that can be different from one week to the next to the next. So I like the variety that you get in mm -hmm. episodic television. And seasons one and two of Enterprise are highly episodic. And I'm a huge fan, and you know this, I'm a huge fan of what we've collectively started to call Brandon Braga's weird stuff. Mm-hmm. And this, uh, this season of Enterprise is so rich and full of fun, interesting, weird science fiction concepts and just weird stuff they encounter bebopping around the galaxy. It's a fun season of Star Trek because everything is so new and different. And that's what's so fun about it. I mean, you're, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. They're just kind of be bopping around out there. And week to week, we get a, we get a different story. We get, they, they visit a different place. They meet a different species. They have a different experience. And I love that about the second season. And, and again, I'll, I'll say it once more. I, I think that these are some of the best episodes of Star Trek available. I mean, there are some really, really good episodes of Star Trek. So I say this to our listeners out there that maybe aren't uh, real fans of Enterprise. I, I just say, give it a, give it another chance and go back and watch these first two seasons. I think they're the strongest inaugural two seasons of a Star Trek series out there. And I, I just, and again, this is my opinion, take it for what it's worth. But I think in comparison to the next generation that is wildly popular with, with fans, I think that season one and two of Enterprise really knock it out of the park. And in comparison to next generation, I just, I just don't think there's a comparison. Well, I remember watching season two in its first run when I was living in the graduate student housing at UC Santa Cruz. So hi to all my UC Santa Cruz peeps out there. I know some of you are listening. And I remember at the time thinking that season two was getting a little weird. There is some weird science fiction stuff that goes on inside this season. And at the time, it struck me as weird, but that was coming out of Voyager and coming out of, of TNG, where, where frankly, the stories got a little predictable and a little formulaic at a certain point, even despite all the novelty and all the interesting philosophical stuff that goes on inside those those shows. But as I was as I was rewatching this season now, uh, and even before I started rewatching, because I, I often don't have the time to rewatch an entire season before we start recording, I'm too, too busy to do that. I don't have time for that. So I did reread all the synopses and watched a, watched a few. And as I was rereading the synopses of the episodes, I was just uh, amazed, frankly, at how innovative and interesting and different uh, the, the episodes are from episode to episode. The concepts and the science fiction ideas, and the goal I think wasn't necessarily to be philosophical philosophically rich and deep and interesting. I think you get some some well-developed philosophical storylines in the later seasons that we've talked about already on previous episodes of Essential Trek Philosophy here on, on, on Metatrex. But I do think the goal was to introduce novelty. And it, you have to remember that the goal of Enterprise was to set the clock back 100 years when everything in the galaxy was brand new mm -hmm. and, you know, to be more like the original series, stepping out into the unknown. And, you know, for all we know, there are wonders that we can't fathom out there in the universe. And Inter Enterprise was trying to capture some of that wonder and novelty that every time you bump into something new, there's an unexpected delight or you know, thing to be afraid of or an ad adventure or something unexpected you have to deal with. And it was just such novelty from episode to episode. And, I, and frankly, at the time, I just thought it was a bit much like, wow, this is like really crazy and weird from episode to episode. But now that I'm older, I think I appreciate what they were going for. And I and I've come to appreciate it. Indeed. Well said. We want to remind our listeners how our essential Trek philosophy goes. So, Zachary, what we've done, we have taken each iteration of Star Trek. We're going in backwards order. So we've worked our way backwards now to season two of Enterprise. And again, working our way backwards, we have selected episodes of each season that we feel are particularly rich philosophically. And each of us, you and I, have compiled lists, and we haven't shared our lists, so I don't know what's on your list, you don't know what's on my list, we're going to talk about these episodes, not in any particular depth in any way, but we're going to touch on what we find uh, interesting about them philosophically, and at the end of the episode uh, today, we will, we will share our complete list 
uh, the central Trek philosophy from season two of Enterprise. Yeah, well said, Mike. The goal here is not necessarily to dive into a lot of depth in any one of these episodes or any one of these topics. We want to give an overview of the entire season of Enterprise as a whole. And if you're listening out there and looking for philosophically interesting episodes of Star Trek to watch, hopefully we can give you a nice uh, targeted list, a, 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 sh- a shorter list than the entire season of what, what episodes to go to to get some philosophical meat to your Star Trek experience. Yes, yes. So, Zachary, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to give you the first pick of Essential Right off the bat? Right off the bat. Way to throw throw Uh, me under the bus right off the bat. So I should preface this, that oftentimes I put these lists together in no particular order as I kind of whittle my list down. This time, I went a little different, and they're kind of in more like chronological order. Okay. Because I started at the beginning and worked my way to the end, and I put together a list. So you get these in chronological order versus no particular order. I don't think mine is in in any particular order. (laughs) Not that it's any help more helpful or hurtful than no particular order, but that's my preface. So the first one I came up with is Dead Stop. (laughs) Is that on your list? First one. (laughs) Maybe we have the exact same list and we don't know it yet. I have eight and you have eight. That would be fascinating. Five and three honorable mentions. Well, Mike, since this is on your list too, do you want to give one of your epic... Mike Morrison (laughs) Enterprise episode synopses that only you could do? Well, it's funny because this is the first one on my list as well. Dead Stop is actually a follow-up and and a very interesting follow-up to the episode Minefield. As Enterprise is kind of limping around the galaxy after that run-in with the Romulan Minefield, uh, things don't look so good. And they send out a general distress call and they're given coordinates for a repair center. So they arrive at the repair center, and it seems that uh, Travis is mortally wounded as they arrive, and he dies. And so they discover that the dead Travis is actually a doppelganger, a duplicate. And things on this station aren't as they particularly seem. And so as the ship is being repaired... Uh, they are trying to unravel the mystery of what's happened to Travis and what's really going on at this strange, uninhabited station. So the thing that I found interesting about this episode was this idea that the original beings, not the duplicates, because we know that Travis has been duplicated and it looks like Travis has died, but the original Travis is with a group of other aliens that are all being used for their brain processing power, essentially. It, it reminds me a lot of the Matrix, actually, like the idea of using humans for their batter, as, a, as a battery, right, as the source of energy. But it, in this case, they're using it for brain power. So I find this interesting for, for a couple of reasons. One, the ethical dilemma of whether it's okay to use another being for your own purposes. And, and we do that all the time we use beings here on earth for uh research you know we we kill animals for for uh medical research purposes and whatnot we're always using other beings for our Mm -hmm. own purposes we kill them for food whatnot so it raises all of those ethical issues that i happen to find interesting but it also raises an issue to me about the processing power of the human brain because on the one hand we have a massively complex neural network that is processing all kinds of information, you know, sensory inputs and telling my body what to do and processing our discussion and all this stuff that's going on in in our brains, right? On the other hand, if I think about what processing power I actually have in like some numeric quantitative, you know, computational sense, like how many, how many, how many are, like how many arithmetical operations can I do in a minute, right? Like one plus one equals two, mm-hmm. two plus two equals four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually remarkably slow at doing, you know, like strict numerical computations the way that computers do in terms of input. Now, if you, if you fed me a bunch of questions, you know, I wouldn't be able to spit out the answers very fast. So even though I've got all this massive neural energy and power and I get this complicated neural network, from an input-output processing standpoint, I actually don't have a very great capacity. Nothing, no, no, nothing to, not to, <laughs> not to denigrate my own brain or anything, but it's really not as, it's not as efficient at that kind of thing as, say, an actual computer. But scientists have said for decades that the human brain's processing power is is really unmatched and you talk about a brain in a vat we're talking about brains plugged into a vat and and that vat is being used to basically power this entire station 
And when they arrive, they the Enterprise is given a list of things that they can present as payment. But it really seems what this station wants is another brain to plug in. Because after all, these, these bodies... And, and it's really interesting because, Zachary, when they walk in and they find that central core where all of these uh, humanoid beings... I mean, we got we've got... Cardassians, and by the way, it's the only time that we ever see a Cardassian in Enterprise. We see a Cardassian in that room, and we got Cardassians and Klingons and Vulcans. Oh my! And they are all plugged in to this to this machine. It's such a dystopian uh, kind of scene that they've put together in there, and their brains are being used, and they 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 eventually wear out and have to be replaced, and and that's what ha- that's what's happened here. So. You do have this interesting ethical dilemma. Is it is it okay to use people for your own purposes? So so we have that, uh, but we also have uh, some really interesting uh, explorations as to you know what the potential of the of the human brain is. We have a, a really great exploration of art, artificial intelligence because we have an artificial intelligence in, in this that seems to be at first benevolent. And then as we go through the episode, this artificial intelligence seems to become more malevolent rather than benevolent. And uh, I will say the Roxanne Dawson, who uh, uh, famously plays Belana Torres in Voyager, she directed this episode and she is the voice, the creepy voice of this uh, of this artificial intelligence. I will say, as far as some interesting... She got to play a creepy computer voice on Voyager. Yeah, this too. isn't the first time she's done it and done it well. Uh, so a couple other interesting little pieces of trivia. They actually reused an exocomp from Star Trek The Next Generation. I hope it got all the pay that's coming yeah, to it. Yeah, because here they introduce some really interesting technology that we see commonly in The Next Generation, in Voyager, and Deep Space Nine. But you're seeing it really for the first time, replicators and things of this sort, the medical technology. Malcolm is is still nursing an injury from the previous episode, Minefield, uh, where... Uh, a spire had gone through his leg, and this and it's an exocomp. They basically took an exocomp, they made a couple of modifications to it, and they actually used it uh, as a as a medical droid in in some ways to uh, regenerate his leg. They also used the uh, the artificial intelligence character from the Voyager episode Think Tank, that was actually the central core uh, processor. Uh, for this station. So a couple interesting little pieces of trivia, but really, really great exploration. You know, that bra- oh, brain in a vat thing and and the, the pr- processing power of the brain, artificial intelligence. And, and again, that ethical problem that you have with, you know, is it, is it OK to to use people for your own purposes? This is a, this is a really great episode philosophically. So Roxanne Dawson's, you know, evil computer voice in this, was she actually the voice of some sort of like proto Borg collective since you know the <laughs> since the, the the since the ship is being kind of pa- not powered necessarily but its processing power is being powered by the brains of all the people that are hooked into this system right yeah and you know they this is one of the one of my favorite endings to a Star Trek episode you know at the end of the episode don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it but after 10 years if you haven't seen it then shame on you but <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the episode, Enterprise fires a couple torpedoes, blows the thing apart. And at the end of the episode, they go back as you know, Enterprise warps off into the sunset. They go back to the field of debris, and this station has already started to repair itself. So one of my one of my favorite endings to a Star Trek episode because it just left this opening for all kinds of really interesting future possibilities. Unfortunately, we never got to explore, but I, I thought it was fascinating nonetheless. Well, I think what I find interesting about this kind of moral dilemma is that it looks simple on the surface, and then when you when you dive in and start to to analyze the scenario and, and decompose it a little bit, you realize that it's a bit more complicated than it looks at first glance. On the surface level, I think this episode looks like a really simplistic telling of the Kantian principle that you shouldn't use other people as a means to your own ends, mm-hmm. right? It's not okay to strap people down and do things to them against their will, right, generally. On the other hand, you can go, well, wait a minute. What if it was someone like like Adolf Hitler or what if it were Gul Dukat or if it were someone really evil, right? What if you could strap that person down and say <laughs> and and hook them up to the evil Roxanne Dawson machine and say, 
and save a bunch of people's lives in the process. You know, if you could strap one person to the evil Roxanne Dawson machine and save a thousand people, then why isn't that the right thing to do? So you can kind of weigh these these principles of not uh, uh, violating other people's autonomy and treating other people with respect against the good that can be done by harming a small number of people to save a larger number of people. Mm. It's interesting you say that because it very well could have been Gal Ducat's like great great grandfather strapped to that thing, uh, but unfortunately Archer couldn't save any of them because after all, once they've been integrated into the system so long, they can't be pulled out. And that is my new that is my new head cannon, by the way. That is Granddaddy Ducat. <laughs> Granddaddy Ducat. I like it. I like it. I'm I'm all for it. But yeah, the, the, just such a great episode all the way around. And uh, I think that uh, Enterprise hit it out of the park. I also found it very interesting the way Archer and some of the others were pushing back against, say, replicator technology. Trip is just absolutely fascinated with the pan-fried catfish that this this replicator can make. And Archer doesn't want anything to do with it. He, you know, he's pushing back against it. He doesn't, he doesn't trust Why? it, he doesn't is, like it. And I thought that was, like a, I thought that was is, really interesting. What is it, like a Trojan catfish or something? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's he worried about? That this, you know, this thing's going to bust open with Borg technology. The little nan- nanites are going to c- come pouring out of that catfish and infiltrate Yeah, it. like, is it, po- is it poisonous? <laughs> is it bugged? Like, what, what is he worried about? <laughs> I just I found that really interesting that here's this, you know, it's 24th century technology that we're used to seeing in in Next Generation and Deep Space Nine and Voyager and Archer's just pushing back against it. He doesn't want anything to do with it. And and I I, I find that fascinating. And, it is, and isn't that human nature? I think it's really interesting that in the 22nd century, you would still have technophobia, given how technological <laughs> society has become at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But it, again, isn't that human nature? Well, yeah, we're always afraid of change and what we don't know and what we don't understand. And, you know, I mean, heaven forbid we get replicated catfish. We don't get to experience the joy of fishing anymore or eating real catfish or going, you know, going to the lake. But I guess Captain Cisco goes to the lake with Jake in the holodeck. So, you know, sure. what we got to lose. There's nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. We'll still go fishing, even if even if it's replicated pan fried catfish. <laughs> So Zachary, as I said, Dead Stop was number one on my list. And again, I, my list is in no particular order. My next episode on my list of Essential Trek philosophy is the episode Stigma. That is episode 14 of season two. We get to meet Flox's wife, Feasel. And what an interesting gal she is. This This episode for me, really explores a lot of interesting philosophical themes. First of all, we are introducing into this narrative the idea of alternate morality. Uh, Fiesel is interested in Trip. Trip is freaking out the whole episode because he's worried that, you know, Flox is going to find out and be upset with him. And, you know, she's a married woman and he's a perfect gentleman. Uh, Trip's always famous for saying, I was a perfect gentleman, Captain. I was a perfect gentleman. And he was. He was a perfect gentleman. She was coming on to him pretty strong. And when he finally goes to Flox and talks to him about it, Flox is like, oh, did she offer to draw you a bath? Oh, there's nothing but, you know, Flox is all into it. And it, it kind of, uh, you know, it, it it kind of weirds trip out a little bit. And so you have this this idea of, of alternate morality. And Flox really approaches that subject because trip presents himself as a pretty traditional guy and Phlox is saying, hey, you know, you're going to be meeting all kinds of interesting species out there and, and you're going to be interest, uh, introduced to all kinds of different ideas and different moralities. And, you know, you, you, you've you got to, you know, you've got to You should sample to, the menu. You've yeah. got to learn, to, learn <laughs> right. to embrace it. But in the midst of all of that, and this is where I love this title because you have this stigma of, you know, this kind of love triangle, if you will, that's going on. But uh, to Paul is also ha- experiencing a dilemma of her own. She is suffering from a disease that is stigmatized in her culture. And she and Flox are trying to appeal to the Vulcan uh, Science Academy, to, the, uh, to some Vulcan scientists, to get some research so that Pinar can be treated 
and how that was handled and the ethics of of how we handle uh, diseases that carry with it certain stigma. And uh, this is obviously a nod to the ongoing fight against AIDS uh, that, again, in the 1990s and early 2000s, and, and still today, uh, it carries a stigma. And we don't hear as much about it today as we did in the late 80s, early 90s, and into the early 2000s. But, uh, uh, you know, certainly that was, uh, that was kind of the underlying theme, you know, that Pinar kind of represented in this episode. And, you know, I found it fascinating the way that they dealt with it. And uh, I think that they uh, really approached it in an interesting way. Philosophically, it's challenging. Uh, because, uh, you know, we realize that one of the doctors uh, possessed the ability to mind meld and he was keeping it a secret and had to come out, you know, in order to get uh, to her the information she needed so that Dr. Flox could treat her. It's a great episode, a lot of interesting things going on in it. So there's a lot going on in this episode. You can kind of, I think, divide this episode into two different portions. Mm -hmm. The first portion being this bit about alternative lifestyles, alternative moralities. And I have a question for you about this. Do you just dramatically, do you think Tripp's kind of down home folksy kind of demeanor in talking about this helps or hurts the, this episode's message about those things? Cause he kind of has this golly gee, you don't sleep with another man's wife kind of, <laughs> you know, you don't let, you don't let another man's wife draw you a bath kind of, kind of, um, <laughs> you know, you know, that's not what we did back on the farm kind of, kind of approach to thing. I'm not sure that really helps get the message across because he comes across as w massively simplistic for the 22nd century. <laughs> You know, Zachary, honestly, it didn't bother me at all. And part of, I think part of the appeal of Star Trek is that they have a way of really appealing broadly and presenting attitudes and ideas that are current in a way that is futuristic. I, I think that there will be people, at least in my opinion, I think in the 22nd, even 23rd, 24th century, I, th I think there'll be people who still hold to what we would maybe label traditional morality. I think I think Tripp is is somewhat of a traditional guy. He presents himself in that way. And I don't think it hurt the episode at all. Because I think what it does is it challenges uh, people really on both sides. I mean, I could say it it challenges people who, you know, hold fast to traditional morality. But I think I think it also can challenge because it it, th there was a challenge there to Phlox as well. And, you know, that that idea, and at the end of the episode, he and Fiesel kind of laugh between themselves at Tripp's, you know, trepidation over this innuendo. His trepidation? <laughs> Tripp's trepidation. His trepidation. His trepidation. They, they're kind of, you know, sharing a laugh about it. And, but but the reality is, you know, I I, I think it, I think it challenges their own ideas as well that they have to they they have to stop and say, you know, hey, that there are people in the galaxy who who don't share our morality. They they couple, they don't have, you know, these complex uh these complex uh, marital uh relationships where, you know, for for the Denobulans, it's, you know, every Denobulan man has three wives and every Denobulan woman has three husbands and what an interesting It's all very complicated. Kind of, mess that is but <laughs> that's a complicated social network. it's a complicated right social network and and so i i think it's a challenge to to flocks as well to to look at another species and say okay they've they've got their thing and it and it works for trip he's a he's a one you know he's a one woman man well i th i think there's something to this notion that that Phlox and his wife, one of his wives, kind of have this chuckle at Trip, like, you know, he's a dinosaur. He doesn't get it. You know, he's, he, isn't that human morality cute? <laughs> you know, but, but there's something to that, because if you look at the history of our own country, maybe world by extension, but thinking kind of narrowly in our country, it's that you can tell a story of the United States in terms of a progression of increased rights for different groups of people, from the civil rights movement to women being able to vote and to to sexual rights and whatnot. You know, that that is a, a, a trajectory, right? Granting mm -hmm 
progressively more rights to a greater number of people, people that were excluded one way or another. And so you could plausibly say that, look, if you lose this hang up about morality <laughs> in, in this way, um, so I think you can interpret that trajectory as basically saying, look, you know, as long as you aren't harming other people, as long as you are pursuing your own happiness, not violating the rights of other people, it's a good thing to drop those social hangups and those social mores, to be, for lack of a better phrase, um, for the sake of of individual liberty to pursue happiness as you see fit. And, you know, so there's something too. Flox and his wife kind of chuckling a trip, like, oh, he's still kind of hung up on that old fashioned morality stuff. And we freed ourselves with that. And we're having a better time over here without him. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I guess I could just see that, you know, I, you know, this, you could read this episode as saying, you know, look, if we drop our hangups, we'll all have a better time and we can stop judging other people and be more inclusive. And of course, the Denobians do that in a certain way and different groups of people here on Earth do that a certain way. But broadly, you could say, look, you know, this this kind of restrictive morality does more harm than good. If you lose that, then you can still get all the social benefits of connecting to other people, but not have to have all the the uh, judgmental hangups and, and not have to worry about violating people's rights as much because everyone will just be focused on doing whatever they think makes them happiest. And I think our society has definitely gone that direction. We're not as hung up on this stuff now as we were 20 or 30 years ago. And we forget that this, this season of enterprise comes out of the eighties and nineties and we're in the early two thousands now, right? Yeah. February, we, 2003. Uh, Right. And I think this is a good segue to talk about the other aspect of this episode, which is the commentary on the AIDS crisis. You know, in the 80s and 90s, Star Trek almost didn't touch this with a 10 foot pole. Right. <laughs> you don't see you don't see gay characters in Star Trek. You don't see characters with a with a uh, disease that has a stigma to it. These are things we associate with the AIDS movement in the 80s and 90s. And in, in the 2000s, we can start talking about them. We can have characters with alternative lifestyles. We can have characters with a disease that's a stigma. It's not as blatant, I think, as people would like. I think people would like a more direct reference to things that actually matter here in the real world mm -hmm. inside Star Trek, frankly. But I think that if you, if you read this as metaphor, like it's intended, this is a metaphor for the AIDS crisis. And now, finally, in the early 2000s, we can take these things that were socially unacceptable to talk about and you definitely didn't put on television. <laughs> and now, all of a sudden, they're on television and that is really innovative i think and that's star trek and honestly for for fans who don't appreciate I'm, i mean I've, I've heard fans say oh enterprise doesn't add anything it's not real star trek and and, and i just say you know that's nuts because I, I look at this episode and it's got everything that you love about classic star trek it's got the comedy of you know this relationship between Fiesel and Flox, and and you know throwing trip into the there's some com that's comedy. It's funny and and you laugh and you, at the end of the episode you laugh again. But there's also this very serious side where they've taken something like the AIDS crisis that still in 2003 you turn on a television you're not seeing it really addressed by and large in anywhere in in primetime television and and here they've done it they've given it a, a science fiction spin and it becomes this this really inventive commentary that really shines light on the fact that there are people out there suffering and they they can't talk about it because it carries a stigma and that really limits their options for treatment and they did it brilliantly and and again i just got to say you know brandon braga i hope you listened to our program this is genius, and I don't think you get the credit you, that you deserve for what you and your team brought into uh, Star Trek in Season 1 and Season 2 of Enterprise. Well this is the kind of episode that can really genuinely change people's minds about things. Because if you are not the one who's stigmatized mm -hmm. for this, that, or the other thing, you're not going to get it. You're not going to think it's important. You're not going to care about it. And if you can get people to care about the very idea that some people feel stigmatized, if you can get people to empathize with that entire concept. And I think there are people that just fundamentally don't. They don't get it. It doesn't relate to them. It's not on their radar, right? But if all of a sudden you can get someone being compassionate or empathetic to a character, a fictional character that is analogous for people here in the real world, ideally that would breed more compassion for other people here in the real world. It's that simple. So, so next on my list is, you're going to laugh, A Night in Sick Bay. Oh, okay. Was that on your not list? A, not you on listen? my list, but uh, it was eh. on my long list when I was putting my original list together. It was, but I pared it off. 
Yeah, and I think if, if you'd asked me this a year ago, I don't think I would have put this on my list a year ago, but I think what, what's happened to me since then has put this on my list. Right, This is the episode where where uh, Porthos, Captain Archer's dog, is in sickbay. Yeah, and he has to be like drowned inside this tank and treated. All this really weird stuff happens to Porthos. And, and then Captain Archer spends a night in sickbay, which is where the name of the episode comes from. But uh, it's largely a comedy episode, you know, all the weird stuff that happens in Flocks of Sickbay, which is really interesting on in its own right. You know, if this had no philosophical importance whatsoever, this is a great episode because it's such a funny episode. There is some weird stuff that goes down in Flocks of Sickbay in the middle of the night. <laughs> but w- w- the reason I put this on my list is because... Because I have had to put down several pets over the last year. I've had to put down two cats and a bird in the last, I don't know, 10 months or so. And it was really sad and tragic. And it got me thinking, as I rewatched this episode, it got me thinking about what exactly our responsibilities are to our uh, furried and feathered friends, right? <laughs> we we think we have a great deal of moral, res- moral responsibility to humans to, to go through extreme measures to save their lives. Um, and then it's an interesting question. Do we have the same kinds of responsibilities to our animal friends as we do to our human friends and our human loved ones? Should we take extraordinary measures to to preserve the lives of, of animals or are they somewhat extend, expendable? And we, we do catch ourselves euthanizing animals largely to save money. I think, you know, I, I like for me, I found myself like, you know, I, I was in a weird situation with one of my pets where it's like I could have spent a little more money and kept the animal alive for six more months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Wouldn't have been a great quality of life, but I could have done it. And it just, it was seemed like the compassionate thing to do is just go, you know, it's not going to have a good quality of life. It's going to be really expensive, cost benefit analysis. It's not going to have a happy life. So you mm-hmm. put it down. And we don't do that so much with people. We prolong humans' lives to preserve their dignity because we th- we worry about the distinction between euthanization and murder. And so we don't do that with humans. We draw a firmer line in the sand. We're willing to spend vastly more resources and energy to save human lives. So I guess my fundamental question is what exactly accounts for the difference between the way we approach human medical care and the way we approach animal medical care? And none of that comes up in the episode very much, but Captain Archer clearly wants to save his dog. Mm-hmm. Flox is willing to stay up all night and try whatever he can, innovative medical techniques to save the dog's life. And and the whole episode revolves around saving Porthos. (laughs) And I just find that really fascinating. And in in the 22nd century, we get Captain Archer with his dog on board, and he's got a thousand other things to think about besides his dog. Yeah, like mending relationships with the Cretacens. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. But this entire episode revolves around saving Porthos, and that's the focus. And I just find that such a fascinating dilemma between all the other serious stuff you get in Star, in Star Trek. And, you know, they managed to create a really interesting drama around saving an animal's life. Yeah, this is a fun episode. You're exactly right. And the the whole thing with the medical ethics and, and, and our pets, I... I really love that because it is kind of this heartwarming episode. Thankfully, at the end of the episode, Phlox is able to uh, to take one of his little creatures in his uh, little menagerie that he's got there in sick bay, and he's able to replicate a pituitary and, and perform a surgery and and replace Porthos's pituitary and, and save the dog's life. And but Captain Archer gets to experience uh, you know this this quirky kind of uh, life that Phlox lives down there in sick bay, and it's kind of fun to watch but uh, there's also another little aspect to this that I find interesting this wasn't again on my list but uh, something that as I was compiling my list that I kind of grab gravitated towards and that is this whole situation with the Cretacens this is a this is a species that is uh, unique to Enterprise the series and they are easily uh, offended when we first meet them, they get offended because uh, humans eat by taking their hands to their mouth, and th- that's kind of a sexual thing for them. So they found it very inappropriate for them to be doing, you know, at snicker, the table. Snicker, they snicker. just don't, yeah. you know, they eat the same way, but they don't do it in public. Uh, it's it's very sexual and very personal. And so now uh, Porthos is, you know, peed on a tree. Which is what uh, you know. Every every beagle in the in the in the world dreams about doing, and and this Guilt, is caused guilty. an offense. Yeah. yeah, this is caused an offense. And the other aspect of this episode is to what length will you go to mend fences to try and uh, mend relationships with, in this case, another species, but. 
you know, I think about the way people fall in and out, uh, you know, so we, we social media people get offended and, you know, they, they unfriend each other and, and, and you kind of forget about it and you move on and you, you might have a gripe session at, around the water cooler the next day about, you know, how you got unfriended and, you know, the, the whole drama of what's going on there. But, you know, I, I really found it interesting that Captain Archer was willing in the midst of all of what was going on with Porthos, his, his dear best friend, he was willing to do whatever it took to mend relationships with the Kratassans and the lengths that he went to, to, to do that. And at the end of the episode, we get to see the, the result of that. And it's, it's a bit extreme. <laughs> and it got me wondering, Zachary, you know, to, to what length are we willing to go to, uh, to, to repair a relationship? And as easily as we fall in and out of relationships these days with people, uh, you know, to see this kind of emphasis put on the quality of a relationship and the lengths that you would go to, to try to keep a, a, a good, favorable relationship with somebody. I found it very fascinating. And, and there's something, something really interesting in there philosophically that I sort of gravitated towards. But, you know, in the end, I ended up cutting it off my list. Well, I, I worry I'm going to run the risk of pontificating <laughs> rather than being genuinely philosophical. But I, I think it's interesting you hit on the notion of offense, because I really genuinely think you could term this current time period that we live in today, the age of offense. Yes. In my perfect vision of the world, people would assume a baseline level of respect and a baseline level of tolerance for other people's opinions on things, uh, assuming a baseline level of goodwill that other people are genuinely well-intentioned. Even if they disagree with you, they're not bad people. They mean well. Mm-hmm. They want to see you do well. And if, you, and if that's your premise, if you assume that that's where other people are at, that they're good people like you are, they care about other people like you do, they want to see other people doing well like you do, then if you disagree about something, you don't don't have any reason to be offended about it. But really, in this age of social media, you have to be very careful. If you say something other people disagree with, you can be unfriended, you know, you're going to hear about it, people are going to say they're offended, they're not going to like you. And, you know, you can really kind of second guess yourself against saying anything, right? I mean, think about us here on Metatrex. Think how many controversial issues we talk about. If we second guessed ourselves at every Mm -hmm. turn, we'd never get an episode out, right? At a certain point, you just have to assume that other people are good people like you are, and that if you disagree, they're still good people, and they should still like you, and vice versa. And I think it's just sad that offense has become such a commonplace term, a commonplace um, concept, a commonplace experience for all of us. Because frankly, that should be worse. There, are, there are things you should be genuinely offended about, but I think of them as far worse mm-hmm. than the things people. Um, commonly say they're offended about. I think it cheapens the concept of offense, which is a far more serious concept than it gets credit for these days. Yeah, yeah, truly. But yeah, that that was the... I'm offended at people's offense. (laughs) (laughs) That was the philosophical issue that I really gravitated towards. It's this, this this whole concept of diplomacy and, and how far uh, you're willing to go to, to maintain a good relationship. And again, the Kratassans are, are so easily offended. It almost becomes, you know, there's this eye rolling going on between Archer and Hoshi and, you know, they just, you know, here we, you know, we've done it again, but they're willing to exercise not a little bit of diplomacy, Zachary, a great deal of diplomacy. And again, I, I, I really find that fascinating to, to, to see that kind of played out in our own world. I mean, we're we're struggling as a nation here in the United States with the relationships that we have with with other countries. Some of them have been our allies for decades and those relationships are are being strained and and I I I just find this as interesting now as it was when it first aired in 2003. Well, I think this speaks somewhat indirectly to philosophical methodology in general. When you are reading someone else's philosophical work or when you're having a philosophical conversation or a debate with someone, it's commonplace to invoke what we call the principle of charity. And that means to assume the best interpretation of what someone has to say. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, you're going to be offended all over the place, right? And if, if you go looking for faults in other people's 
problems to the point where you're going to take offense at it, that's not going to lead to a very constructive dialogue, right? Yes. So if you assume the best possible interpretation, the most charitable, the most logical, the most sympathetic, whatever it is, then you are more likely to maintain a healthy relationship. You're more likely to engage with the best versions of someone argu- someone's arguments versus setting up a bad argument only to knock down the bad argument. We call that a straw man argument, right? So I think that's just an important part of of maintaining good relationships is assuming the best from other people. You can do that in terms of their moral character, in terms of their intentions. You can do that in terms of the most logical interpretation of the arguments that they're putting forward. But none of those things involve the concept of offense, right? (laughs) So offense, I think, really does does philosophical dialogue a disservice because when you take offense, you're kind of removing yourself from the discussion. Like, oh, I'm not going to have this discussion anymore because I'm offended at what you had to say and I don't want to listen to it anymore, right? If you If that's not your approach, if you approach things by saying, you know, I disagree with you, but I know you're a good guy, so I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm going to assume you meant something slightly better than you actually said, (laughs) and and, and then I'm going to respond to that, and then you can kind of move the dialogue forward a bit. But if you assume the worst of people, or if you're always taking offense, then you're you're not going to – that will just not lead to a productive philosophical dialogue. It won't lead to a productive relationship either, right? right? If you want healthy relationships, you have to assume the best of people, and if you want healthy philosophical dialogue, you have to assume the best of other people's arguments. I just know that I've been in- inspired. I think from now on, anytime somebody offends me, I think they'd need to get bare chested, speak Kratasin, and be cut, up, who you ask that, cut up a tree, you know. <laughs> cut up a tree and, and lay it in a very artistic way in front of me as they recite Kratasin poetry. Well, so I, what I'm just going to put that love- out there. The next time somebody offends me, that's that's going to be my expectation. <laughs> what I love about the end, what I love about the end of this episode is you're right. This is very Star Trek, you right? Captain Archer is willing to go to somewhat extreme measures to repair the relationship. And here in the real world, we don't do that. And I personally, definitely don't do that. Mm. If someone is on my bad side, they're out. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's it's very difficult for someone to work their way back in if they're already on the out with me. And my I wife, my I, wife is the same way. She always says, "You when I'm done, I'm done." Yeah, I just, I, I'm, first of all, I'm too busy. I don't have time to think about it more than that. And fundamentally, um, I just don't think of that as, as a virtue. So if that's how people want to approach life, that's mm-hmm. fine, but I, I don't have time for it. So I, I'm not willing to go the extra measure. And, and is that, is that a, that's a personal admission that I'm not living up to the Star Trek standard <laughs> in a perfect world, right? I would go out of my way to repair relationships that have been damaged. Bare in the chested real world, and speak, crita- you got a lot yeah, of potassium overnight in the, while your in dog's the real having world, surgery. Here in the real world, I'm like, Travis, set course to the next planet and engage at warp five. I'm out of here. <laughs> Uh, you know, I wish I was more like Captain Archer in this regard, honestly, because I do care about other people and I do care about relationships, but we're all busy. We're all pulled in different directions these days, and you can only maintain so many good, healthy relationships anyway. So, Zachary, you had a night in sick bay on your list. Next on my list is the episode Cogenitor. This is from season two, episode 22. And th- there's a few things going on here. First of all, I, I one of the one of the handful of times that we really get to see the negative consequences of interfering in the affairs of another culture. We don't always really see that in the Star Trek universe. So, you know, the Star Trek is, is by and large very positive. And at the end of the episodes, most of the time, the consequences are usually, uh, you know, good and everything turns out and, you know, the, the Enterprise warps off to the next place, you know, hopeful and, and, and optimistic. But this episode really ends on a tough note. And Trip has interfered in the life of a humanoid who is considered to be in a lesser class. This particular alien species requires three sexes to procreate. Brandon Braga's weird stuff. Brandon Braga's weird stuff. But I relate to this episode on a lot of levels, and I'm going to get extremely personal here, but I I really want to explain why this episode really uh, speaks to me. You know, first of all, again, we see the negative consequences of interference, and I think it's important to see that portrayed in the Star Trek universe, because sometimes when you interfere 
in another country or a, a war or a relationship, whatever it may be. It may be something small. It may be something large. There is a possibility of negative overall consequences, a negative outcome. And we again, we don't see that very often in the Star Trek universe. This is one of those times when Trip sets out to do something very positive, and that is simply to present the opportunity for this cogenitor, this third sex uh, person in this society to to expand her boundaries, its boundaries, to to learn, to learn to read, to uh, to explore the universe around it, and. In so doing, he causes this person to, uh, to, to long for something that it can't have in, in its society. And the uh, despair that overtakes uh, this person uh, causes it to commit suicide at the end of the episode. And it's, it's a very heavy episode. But I want to say that one of the reasons why this episode really speaks to me is... Many, many years ago, my wife and I had been married for about four years when we finally decided that we wanted to have children. And so we, you know, like any other couple, we, you know, we started trying. And after four years, we weren't getting anywhere. And so we went to, we went to a physician. We, we each went to, I went to a urologist. She went to a gynecologist and go through a battery of tests only to find out that, um, you know, there are some roadblocks there to conceiving a child, albeit not impossible. Uh, you're saying another humanoid had the enzyme you needed. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but it, it seemed that way. Uh, but, uh, I, I will say, uh, to, to, you know, kind of save breadth here, um, you know, four years of treatment uh, for, uh, you know, f uh, for this, uh, g going through for myself, uh, because the problem was on my end, um, I, ex I went through some experimental uh, treatments uh, to, to try and improve things, and we still didn't have a child. And, I will say that during that period of time, and we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the mid to late 1990s, early 2000s, in my inner circle of friends, and this is going to sound strange, I know, to some people, but there were, there were folks who were not very supportive of our, our decisions to, to go through testing and treatment and, uh, you know, friends that we had known for years that, you know, weren't very supportive, that felt, you know, I'll just leave it in God's hands. If God wants you to have a, have a child, you have a child. And, and, you know, we, we sought treatment and, you know, we lost friends over this and, and it was, it was a very sad time because again, we, you know, we felt that, you know, we wanted to pursue, uh, you know, alternate means to try to conceive a child. And uh, for, for me, that was an alternate uh, uh, treatment. That was a, an experimental treatment. Uh, it did not immediately produce results. We went through several, um, you know, several procedures to try to conceive while I was undergoing treatment. And uh, I spent a lot of money and, you know, four years of our life and, and no baby. Funny, funny thing, Zachary, the rest of the story is, uh, after we quit, <laughs> a month later, completely uh, without help, uh, we conceived our, our beautiful daughter, Hannah, uh, that uh, just turned 15 last month. So this, this, this episode hits me on a really personal level. No, we didn't need an enzyme from a third party, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I, 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 it wasn't quite the story, you know, it was a slightly different story than I thought you were going with that, but you know. it's, but this, this hits me on a, on a very personal level. And, um, there were people around us who didn't understand what we were going through and that's okay, by the way. Uh, and, but there were a lot of people who tried to interfere and try to invoke their own personal opinions and their own ideas and their own morality and their own, you know, theology and, and just didn't really didn't really understand our situation and what we were going through. You know, I think this is somewhat related to the discussion we were having about a night in sick bay because one thing I've learned, and I think you've probably learned it, and everyone learns this in their own way, 
is that you can't control other people's reactions, right? Some people are going to be offended and you can't mm -hmm. do anything about that, right? In this case, um, you know, the, the alien that commits suicide, right? This third gendered person that commits suicide at the mm -hmm. end of the end of the story. You can't control that, right? There were every, all the best intentions were, were there inside the episode and it still led to some terrible consequence and you can't control that. Um, you talked about, you know, friends of yours that didn't understand what you were going through. You can't control other people's reactions, exactly. right? And I think that's just a hard lesson to learn. I've gone through some hard experiences in my life where I've just had to learn that I can't be responsible for how other people react to things, sure. right? That if I put that all on my own shoulders, I'll drive myself batshit crazy, <laughs> <laughs> right? Or or <laughs> whatever kind of bat that was that lives in Flock's <laughs> sick bay. <laughs> Flock's bat crazy. Um. And I think that's that's a hard lesson to learn. And I think, you know, having been an educator, I experienced this where you have all the best intentions. Students come into your classroom and you try to help them, you know, see a different way they could be and think about things they haven't thought about, about before and see possibilities for themselves that they didn't see. And you know what's good for them, right? And some of them are going to blow it off. Some of them, some of them are going to drop your class. Some of them have personal problems going on. Mm -hmm. For all you know, some of them are going to walk out the door and commit suicide, right? You have no idea. You can't control what goes on in other people's reactions. And there, there's a sense in which you just have to be a little, I think, a little detached from those things where you go, I, and I, I'm, I'm a terrible person at being detached. I get really invested in things too much so where I really do drive myself crazy when I'm really invested in something because, uh, but I, I've had to learn that detachment is actually like a better strategy <laughs> <laughs> that, if, that if you, if you try to worry about that, you will you will spin you you'll put yourself in your own headspace and won't be able to kind of function normally because you you know you just can't control the people's reactions are radically unpredictable and so are consequences and even though we try our best to lead to good consequences we try our best to lead to good outcomes that we can predict um humans and humanoids by extension are kind of unpredictable you know and you can't control that and it's sad because you kind of go god i wish i could make the situation better i wish i could lead to a better outcome mm -hmm. or i wish i could prevent whatever and sometimes you just fundamentally can't and if you obsess over the powerlessness of that you will forget that you'll 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 ruin the good things about your own life yeah i think so that's my, again, I feel like I'm more, I'm like more pontificating than actually being philosophical in this episode. But I think that's a good lesson to, to take away from this, that, that consequences are genuinely unpredictable, that the best of intentions can lead to really bad consequences. And if you let that stop you from trying to do good things, you'll never do anything good. Yeah. And I think it can be argued in this episode that Tripp's intentions were good. And certainly he felt that he was doing the right thing. In fact, he says to Archer as much. He said, he says to Archer, you know, I was just trying to do what you would do. And, and Archer calls him to task on that, on that comment, you know, because Archer's saying, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, I, I think it could be argued that from Tripp's perspective, that might've been something that Archer would have done to, to try and enrich the life of the, of this cogenitor. So, so Tripp's actions, I think were, were, were noble in, in his, you know, in his own mind, his own heart. He really felt he was doing something very noble, very, very right for this person, but the, the consequences were negative. And, and isn't that just life? And, I, when I think about you know the, the these kind of ethical dilemmas, and that's what this really boils down to, and even in my own life, there were people who said some things that were really kind of horrible when you think about it, uh, very very, um, very very heartless uh, in 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 ways, mm -hmm. or at least seemingly heartless. And I think when I look back on those on on those comments and those experiences that I had, I, I think that people were well meaning and for the for the most part. And I, I think they meant well, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, they, they weren't going through what I was going through. They didn't understand the situation that we were in. And, and, and really today, there's still, there's still somewhat of a stigma attached to infertility. And it's something that people don't talk about a great deal, even though there are, you know, a, a myriad of solutions out there for people just talking and, and, you know, getting, getting the facts and getting the information is still very difficult because people don't talk about it. And, and it's very, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you have in hush, hush conversations. And well, I, this episode is very related to stigma. I mean, sure, you know, it, absolutely it, it, there, it is. there's kind of a, there's kind of a theme of alternative lifestyles and gender bending. And yes. this is, this is, this comes up a couple times in this, in this season. Yeah. Yeah. And, and TNG kind of did kind of did a uh, spin on this as well. So, you know, it's not the first well, time really that Star Trek has kind of tackled these things. 
Well, you said something really interesting that, that we, I mean, a little bit ago, we talked about the principle of charity, that it's good to assume the best of other people. Absolutely. And, you, and you said, you know, for the most part, people meant well, even if they said some really hurtful things and didn't act very well. And I think I've had to learn, again, through some hard experiences, that there are people that really do mean well, but are still toxic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, are, and are not worth being around because they will poison, you know, the good things in life. So, you know, I've had to kind of, you know, detach myself from poisonous people and poisonous environments mm-hmm. sometimes. And that's hard because I like, I do care about people. And I, I do sort of have this Star Trek-y optimistic view that you can kind of repair all the broken things and put it all back together and it'll all be one happy federation again. Yeah. Right? But in reality, I've had to learn that, you know, people generally mean well, principle of charity, but they're still toxic and not good for me to be around. So don't, throw, don't put myself in that bad situation again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So was this on your list? It was, um, although for a slightly different reason. I, I mean, I think, you know, this episode tries to also give some commentary on the notion that there's an entirely different class of people that have a different, that are viewed as having a different set of abilities. And I think we, we do tend to compartmentalize and segregate and view people through different lenses, and we don't tend to see each other as, as much as equals as we should, right? mm-hmm. we we tend to categorize people and label them and you know project things onto them, and that's going on in this episode. This is a humanoid sure. uh, a person that has all the same abilities as the other humanoids in the episode, but that person doesn't view itself because it's a third gender yes. right? as as having those abilities. Is not viewed by other people as having those abilities, and to try to get everyone on the level playing field of that egal- egalitarian view, where everyone is viewed as having the same potential is an ideal that does not really come to fruition in this episode and sadly doesn't come to fruition here in the real world. So that's kind of why it's on my list, more of more of a commentary on this this notion that um, we can sadly sometimes categorize other people and not view them as having the same potential we do. Mm. So Zachary, by my count, Dead Stop Stigma, A Night in Sick Bay, Cogenitor, four picks, three of those were on my list, uh, Dead Stop Stigma and Cogenitor. The only one that wasn't on mine was Night in Sick Bay. So it seems to me that you have another pick to share. Yeah, so the next on my list is Marauders. Okay. That's yeah, one of my honorable remember, mentions. Okay, that, if you remember, that's the episode where the good crew of the Enterprise has to kind of intervene to protect this. I think they're they're mining something. I mm-hmm. forget what they're, what they're mining. They, to the protect these. The deuterium, thank you, to protect the deuterium miners from the intervention of these Klingons that are coming in and stealing their stuff and wreaking havoc and generally making for a bad quality of life. And uh, I, again, I put this on the list not because it's like deeply philosophical, but I might put it in the category of like wisdom lessons, like Proverbs from the Old Testament or something. Right? There's a really good lesson here, I think, which is that if you want to earn respect, the way you do that is to roll your sleeves up and get down in the trenches with people, help them solve a problem mm-hmm. and and really be there to, 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 you know, sort of fight alongside them and be a companion. And set, oftentimes, and it's very easy to do this in Star Trek, they could have just taken the deuterium and said, so long, thanks, you know, we're out of here. And Captain Archer would have been well within his rights to not get involved at all, right? But what he does is get involved and he actually ends he ends up earning friendship and mutual respect and a relationship with these people, all because he and, and the rest of his crew rolled up their sleeves, got their hands dirty, moved the stuff around to psych the Klingons out and, you know, fight with the Klingons, mm-hmm. essentially. And that's how you earn respect with people. Whatever, you know, And I, I think this is something that's also very easy to forget about people. Everyone is fighting a battle inside. You don't know what it is. They've got something they're struggling with, something they're worried about, whatever. And the way you build relationships with those people is to actually get involved and get down in the trenches. And too often, I'm totally guilty of this, you know, along the lines of what I just said, I totally check out sometimes. But too often we, we warp out of there rather than getting our hands dirty and rolling up our sleeves and getting down in the trenches with people. Yeah. This has got one of my favorite Captain Archer lines in, in Star Trek Enterprise. And that is, I've never liked bullies trip, not on earth and not out here. Uh, this, this is a great episode. It was, it's on my honorable mentions list. Uh, well, there's something, there's something to this because, um, 
I don't like bullies either. I was bullied a lot as a teenager. Mm-hmm. I doesn't. I don't think I was scarred by it. In fact, I'm friends with some of the people who used to bully me. It's you know we kind of laugh about it in some ways. But I've been in a couple of fights. I've punched a couple of people. You, you wouldn't know that to look at me now. But <laughs> but I don't like bullies either. You know I don't like being picked on. And right. sometimes and I've got a breaking point. You push me just a little too far, and I'll snap a little bit. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think that's, I think there's something virtuous about it. There's a negative sense of that, like, oh, you know, picking a fight and you're violent and whatnot. But I think there's, there's a sense in which, you know, we do, for better or worse, we're biological beings that can use force, right? Mm-hmm. In Star Trek, we do it with phasers. Here on Earth, we do it with our fists and with, with other weapons, right? But sometimes, you know, people cross the line and you need to, you know, use force rather than words. And I, I think that's an important part of the Star Trek vision. I think you, you, you wouldn't have the same version of Star Trek if they were all pacifists, right? <laughs> and here in the real world, you do need to use force to stand up to injustice. Mm-hmm. And, and cultivating that as a virtue that you stop, you know, when you see injustice happening, you don't let it go by, you intervene and do what you can, even if that means, you know, rolling up your sleeves and, you know, throwing a punch or two. Yeah, I'd like to think that con... <laughs> would have rolled his sleeves up and <laughs> thrown a punch or two. That, 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 I would, that's a very, I'm not sure that... That's a very Kantian idea. And and honestly, that's that's why it's on my honorable mentions list. I don't think I don't think people think of Kant as the kind of guy who would roll up his sleeves and throw a punch. <laughs> but, you know, Kant, that, that's part of the categorical imperative, right? It's always the right thing to do to try to stop injustice. So <laughs> if that means that Immanuel Kant... Over there in Königsberg, <laughs> has to roll up his sleeves and get down in the mud and throw a few punches at the unjust people in the world. Maybe he did, and we just don't know about it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we did, and we do know about it. And I don't know about it. <laughs> this episode represents an interesting tension that I think goes on in the first couple seasons of Enterprise, especially. You know, we were just talking about the negative consequences of interference and Tripp saying, you know, Captain, I was just trying to do what you would do. And, you know, he kind of cites these types of situations where, you know, Captain, you you interfered. You know, and Archer sees these deuterium miners suffering under the heavy hand of uh, of the Klingons. And he's, you know, he's, he's not liking the way that they're going to be that they're being bullied and he's going to do something about it. And, and again, that's a very Kantian idea. If you see somebody uh, who is, you know, struggling against something, suffering, you see somebody hurting, you're you're compelled to to do something to to help them. And we we see that here. Although uh, I think the I think the flip side can be argued. And you you made the point. He was well within his rights to just you know pack up and say, okay, we we don't want to get involved here, but. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I think he made the right call. And but, you know, again, when uh, Tripp sitting in his quarters after the episode co-genitor, I'm I'm sure he was thinking about this very situation well, and trying to figure out where he went wrong. <laughs> if you stand up to a bully who's picking on your friend, you've probably earned a friend for life. And I've got a real example of this. I know for a fact that my my old friend, Mark Beaumont, who I know listens to this podcast, and he stood up to a bully who was picking on me in junior high and he's still my friend and we're friends for life. We couldn't be more different in some ways and we're similar in some ways, but we became friends for life all because he helped stand up to a bully who was picking on me back in junior high. So earned a friend. For, and that's what Captain Archer does. He's basically earned friends for life because he got rid of the Klingon bullies. Yeah, no doubt about it. So, again, is that philosophy? I don't know. I think these are important life lessons in any case. So, Zachary, next on my list is the episode Dawn. Otherwise known as Enemy Mine. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this particular episode is really fascinating to me because at the beginning of this episode, the Trip and this alien they're they're enemies. Uh, it's as a result of, of of phaser fire that Trip's ship is is disabled and they're at each other's throats, literally at the be- at the beginning of this episode, and in their mutual suffering and their their mutual difficulties they find common ground and they forge a bond and at the end of the episode as the alien is uh, walking out of sick bay uh, he says that uh, he's sorry that he uh, shot trip down and he's glad that uh, that 
you know, they, they survived and it was really satisfying. Trip didn't have, Trip didn't have to raise the alien's baby named Zombies. <laughs> Great reference there. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen Enemy Mine, yes, that's, that's your home. That's your if Meta you haven't Trek's seen it, that's assignment. a great movie. And uh, uh, Dennis Quaid and Lou Gossett Jr., fantastic movie. With Jeffrey Combs playing zombies. <laughs> the part of zombies played by Jeffrey Combs. Yes, yes. So nothing, I, I, do, I really don't have a lot to say about this other than uh, I, I really have an appreciation philosophically for this idea of two enemies experiencing the same difficulties and finding common ground. I, I I think there's something very satisfying about that concept. And, and honestly, I, I, again, I think that I think there would be a lot less bloodshed in the world. If, if we all walked a mile in one another's shoes, I think it's easy to forget now being how, how many years, 15 years removed from this, right. But this season of enterprise is steeped in post nine 11, post September 11th, worldview right we have terrible evil things happening in the world we've got not just enemies but we have dehumanized enemies that don't fundamentally don't understand each other right and that's maybe always been true and we just didn't realize it because every generation kind of forgets all the lessons of the past but i think we we in this post 9 11 world especially right after september 11th you know we have two fundamentally different cultures we have fundamentally different worldviews we have some terrible evil things happening in the world and there's a danger of dehumanizing other people and they might be doing the same thing to you for all you know and you know i how to bridge these deeply set differences that 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 tend to divide people is re, people is a really interesting question but what ha- happens and i what what i love about this an enemy of mine and in this story when you take individuals and separate them from their culture and their governments and their worldview and you put them you know together in some isolated environment a desert island or a planet or whatever you know and invariably people have the same needs and the same desires and the same drives and they're they're vastly more similar than either one of them would have given credit the Mm -hmm. other credit for that's not to trivialize the genuine differences between people and cultures and worldviews and governments because there are some you know fundamental differences there too but i think we in a great many cases you can find that most people are, are more similar than anyone would admit to when you strip them of all that extraneous stuff and talk about their bare essentials and their bare their basic needs and their basic sort of hierarchy of needs in, in life, you know, they're, they're more similar than, than anyone admits. And if you can remember that it's easier to build bridges, but we, again, sadly, we just forget that too often because we're steeped in governments and worldviews and politics and religion. And we forget that basically we're all essentially the same creatures to, to, to vastly oversimplify it. But I, I, again, this is not a deep lesson, right? We know this about people, but if we know that, if we know that people are basically the same and we know that if you take two people and you sit them down across the table together or put them on a desert island or stick them on a planet that they're probably going to get along eventually, <laughs> why don't we remember that more often? It's an interesting puzzle. If it's such an obvious point, why isn't it uh, taken to heart more often? So, Mike, ne- next time you need uh, uh, an enzyme-carrying humanoid to reproduce, if you die early, I will name the child Zombies and love that child in your honor. <laughs> That's good to know, Zachary. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I can count on you to do that, man. What are friends for? <laughs> <laughs> so, Zachary, what's next on your list? So, I actually have The Crossing. Ah, I love that episode. And if you remember, The Crossing is the episode where these non-corporeal aliens start to possess the crew of the Enterprise. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're kind of doing it out of self-preservation. They're, they're, you know, they're worried about the destruction of their own ship. And, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of trying to survive. And, and that's a really interesting question. When you're faced with your own demise, to what extent can you... In fact, it's very similar to the issue we were talking about in Dead Stop, which is to what extent do you have the right or the license to use other people as a means to your own ends? Ordinarily, we think it's not okay to do that. It's not okay to use other people and strap them down or take over their bodies or any of this weird stuff you see inside Star Trek. But um, but when you're faced with your own demise, you know you could take the Hobbesian point of view which is that we're all back in the state of nature and that we have no rights and morality doesn't apply. And if it's me versus you, then I have every right to try to preserve my own life, even if that means sacrificing yours. And I think this episode kind of makes, takes an interesting take on that, that these non-corporeal aliens are faced with their own demise and yeah, they're doing things 
seemingly evil things like taking over other people's bodies and possessing them, violating all these Kantian principles of not using other people, but they're faced with their own demise. And you could argue that they're, it's an us versus them scenario and they're fully justified in doing that. I, this this is actually the last one on my list, apart from my honorable mention, Zachary. And for you have a better synopsis than I do. You're so much better at that. <laughs> for for me, the, the whole thing is this really interesting exploration of the nature of consciousness. Because at the beginning of the episode, it was just kind of this fascinating experience that they were having as Trip's body's taken over, his consciousness wisps away, and. He's kind of out there in the universe, all he's everywhere, all at the same time. He's back on Earth in Florida and, and you know, he's he's having these experiences and he's seeing the universe from a different perspective. And, you know, we realize at, you know, at the end of the episode that it's a very malevolent uh, thing that's happening here. They're, they're, you know, they're really just checking these people out to make sure that they're compatible and they're going to try to take over their bodies and you know they're they're this is how they're going to get off that prison ship and i just find it really interesting the way that they were able to exchange consciousness and it raises all kinds of of interesting questions you know the you know there's this kind of dualism thing that's going on here uh you know the separation of consciousness and body that i found very interesting well, I think it's interesting that when, when philosophers are talking about dualism, like Cartesian dualism, mm-hmm. that, that the mind is a disembodied, non-corporeal substance that's different from our bodies or from our brains or anything else that's made of matter. If you, if you take that literally, that our, our minds are literally not made of matter, not located in space and time, as, as Descartes would put it, well, what would that kind of consciousness be like? You know, if, we're li- if there's literally no location to our consciousness, because it's not matter in space and time, then does that mean it's like transdimensional where you, you, it's not located in space and time. So you can, you really can perceive the entire universe kind of like, like Tripp is doing in, the, in this episode. Right. I, I think we, we, even when we're thinking about dualism, even when philosophers do this, we're often thinking of dualism as if we're, imprisoned in our own little brains like we like we we seem to be right even if dualism seems to be true i'm thinking of it like oh yeah even if i'm this disembodied mind it sure seems to be located in my head somewhere right and and descartes addressed this problem of course by coming up with this idea that the disembodied consciousness or your mind is is connected to your physical body and your brain through a through a substance a gland right the pineal pineal gland gland. he thought was he thought was the, the the location or the locus where the non corporeal mind interacts acts with the corporeal brain and and by extension with the rest with, with the rest of your body which is an absurd idea i think but if if you kind of get rid of that absurd idea from Descartes that the pineal gland binds these two things together and ask yourself, what would it be like to have genuinely non-spatio located consciousness? Could Does that mean you could perceive the entire universe at once because you're literally not located at any location inside the universe? That's a fascinating idea. And, and what's interesting is I almost never hear philosophers talk about that kind of thing when they're talking about Descartes. It's almost like they don't take Descartes seriously enough and, and think through what would it be like to not just talk about the difference between uh, properties of, 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 a, of a dualist, um, you know, non-corporeal mind and a, and a corporeal body, because you can kind of talk about their properties. Well, one is disembodied and the other's embodied and one is located in space and the other one's not located in space. But if you go, what would it be like to actually be that kind of a thing if I'm literally not located anywhere in space? Wow, what what would that what would the phenomena of that consciousness be like? It's so weird. And that's a Star Trek idea. And I love that the start the Star Trek episode spends a little time kind of really fleshing out that 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 notion of of non-corporeal experience. Yeah, I am as well. And that's that's exactly why it's on my list. Now, before what's interesting to me is that doesn't look, that doesn't seem anything at all like what I experience as consciousness. So <laughs> that that might just disprove Descartes' <laughs> Descartes' dualism right there. It sure doesn't. If that's what dualism really implies, something like you can perceive all the universe at once or different parts of it because you're not located in any particular place because you're literally non corporeal, that's not how I experience consciousness. So that gives me some reason to think that maybe consciousness is a bit more tied to the brain than than that episode and, and Descartes thought. Sure. Sure. So I thought what we would do here with our honorable mentions is just kind of do a quick lightning round. No, uh, no real discussion. Just kind of just touch on the episodes that uh, made our honorable mentions list. I'll let you go uh, first and then I'll share mine and then we'll go into final thoughts as we uh, bring things to a close. 
Okay, so I only have two honorable mentions, and one is the episode Horizon. And if you remember, that's the episode where Travis gets to go home to the ship he was raised on. And it's not as easy, you know, his father has died, and he's not getting along with his brother. And I, it just got me thinking about this notion that you can't go home again, that that things change over time, that as much as you might want to hold on to the past or be able to you know, walk in the doors if nothing has changed, time marches on, environments change, people change. And to make a really loose connection to something in philosophy, I think this is related to Heraclitus's view, the ancient Greek philosopher, that that the, uh, you've probably heard the phrase, you can't step in the same river twice. The mm-hmm. change is the fundamental con- uh, constant. And that's exactly what's going on in this episode. You know, Travis essentially gets a chance to go home, but he can't. He can't recapture the magic. His father's died. He doesn't get along with his brother. And they kind of piece it back together and heal a relationship towards the end there with his brother. But it's really not the same scenario. He's changed because he's gone to Starfleet Academy and now he's a, he's on the Enterprise. He's mm-hmm. not the same person he was when, when he left home. And, and all of life is like that. You know, I've moved back to my hometown it's actually it's different than i remember it's I, I think it's a really interesting experience of moving back to my hometown with all the different experiences that other people here didn't have and vice versa it, you know i i kind of want to recapture the magic sometimes but you can't it's just you know the town has changed and i've changed and people have changed and it's important to keep asking what are we what can we do today given that everything has changed around me and i'm not the same person i was 15 or 20 years ago and, Tra- and travis has this very interesting experience of realizing that you can't go home again to some degree yeah, awesome. So that's one. My my second honorable mention is First Flight. <laughs> and we see then Commander Archer competing with another commander, A.G. Robinson, I believe, uh, for who's going to get to be captain of the first Warp 5 starship. And so Archer makes a really interesting quote, a point, which is that no one remembers what Buzz Aldrin's first words were on the moon, right? No one remembers the guy who goes second. So if you want to be remembered, you've got to be the first person to do something. And I, this is so interesting to me because this is really kind of anti-Star Trek in a way. Like Star Trek, the, the humans in Star Trek are usually so noble and pure and high ideals and they don't always try to build monuments for themselves. They're not doing it for personal glory or personal remembrance or personal... Uh, achievement. They're doing it for some more noble purpose. But here we get to see these two commanders duking it out to be first because they want to be the first person, just like Neil Armstrong, just like all the other people in the history of the world who've done great things and were the first person to do something. If you're the second guy, no one's going to remember you. And it just got me thinking that this is kind of a Roman concept, more than an American concept or more than a Star Trek idealized concept. This is These are like Roman emperors here build, trying to build monuments to themselves and beat out the last Roman emperor. Right? It's, just, it's, it's an interesting throwback to an older way of thinking, even for us today, an older, like ancient way of thinking about personal legacy and personal remembrance that you, you build a legacy for yourself by achieving great things. And if you don't do that, you've essentially failed. And I think of that as being really associated, not with Roman philosophy necessarily, but with the mindset of say the Roman emperors, because that's not, that's not how Star Trek characters usually think about, about achieving great things. They're not doing it for a legacy. They're doing it for some noble purpose. But sure. here we get to see Ca- Captain Archer, then Commander Archer, wanting to build a monument to himself, thinking about Thinking about his own legacy, sure. Like, what will they put on my tombstone? <laughs> and AGs, I think, is just in it for the thrill of competition. <laughs> Oh, sure. And that's and that's not exactly a noble purpose either, right? <laughs> From a Star Trek standpoint. And I, and I think this is really amazing that uh, it's an interesting quirk of human nature that those kind of baser instincts can actually lead to great achievements. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. Well put. So those are my two honorable mentions. Are they, are they philosophy? You be the judge. <laughs> Again, like, like I said in the last episode of Metatrex, I've ceased being interested in what counts as philosophy and what doesn't. If there's an interesting lesson in life or an interesting concept or an interesting takeaway, I still find it interesting and I'm going to talk about it. I don't care if it strictly counts as philosophy anymore. T- Ten years ago, Zach would have cared about those things, but you can't go home again. <laughs> well, Zachary, I've got, a, I've got a few honorable mentions. I mentioned already that Marauders was on my honorable mentions list. I had a few uh, honorable mentions. Minefield is on my honorable mentions list. That is the uh, the 
first part of the this sort of a two part thing that they had with Dead Stop. Minefield was the episode preceding Dead Stop in which the Enterprise found itself in a Romulan minefield. And what I find really interesting about this, and, and again, it didn't make my main list because I didn't think it was particularly deep, but what I found fascinating is that there's this whole idea of the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few. And it's funny because it's Malcolm who is kind of wrestling with that. And he goes out there to disengage this, this mine from the hull of the ship. And he goes out there realizing that, you know, it's going to be a dangerous mission. But when the spire goes through his leg, he's willing to sacrifice his life. And he's kind of making the case with Captain Archer, you know, why he needs to be the one to to die, you know, to save Enterprise. And I I, I think that's, I think there's something really interesting. It's just this little nugget about, you know, how far are we willing to go to, 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 say help the people around you know i think about the relationship that i have with my wife i'd die for her i'd die for my daughter you know and i think about our you know and i know we have a lot of listeners who have served in the military those those men and women who put on that uniform no matter what branch of service that, that they're in they do so fully invested in the idea that they may be called upon to make the ultimate sacrifice for for freedom for their country and I I admire that tremendously, and there's there's something really um, really noble about that. And Malcolm, even though to some degree I find him a fatalist, I, I think it's just just a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. He's just a little bit of a fatalist. Um, I I admire that quality in him that he he's going out there. And he realizes that, you know, this this may this may cost me my life, but I'm going to do it for the ship. I, I, I've never seen a character quite like Malcolm before. <laughs> he's he's totally willing to go down in flames in a blaze of glory for some noble purpose, but like draw attention to it. It's like, oh, no, goodbye, cruel world. It's been nice knowing you. I'm doing it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Another one is uh, the communicator, and once again, it's it's you know Malcolm talking about you know dying for the for the cause, and, <laughs> and it, that seems to be a recurring theme in season two. And, well, and I also remember a little bit later in Enterprise in the alternate timeline when he's like the read line came to an unceremonious end. <laughs> you know he, he he he's always like meta commenting on his own misery. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, the thing I thought was interesting about the communicator, and again, it's on my honorable mentions list, not because it was particularly deep. It's a it's a great episode, but you know, it's a piece of technology that's gotten left behind. And you know, I I, I know a lot of people out there are probably thinking oh, that's a it's a stinking communicator. Just forget about it and move on. But you know, they're willing to to take a huge risk and go back there to collect their their things, and in so doing, they actually cause more damage to this society than probably if they would have just, you know, found the communicator. Well, it shows how seriously they're trying to take these fundamental principles in Star Trek, like the prime director. Yes. Yes. And, and it adds to that, to the whole development of that concept. And I get why, why they did it, but I just thought that was interesting. And it's, it's an interesting transition because I think, you know, here in the real world, we hear about the prime directive and we go, Oh yeah, that's a great idea. But when push comes to shove, not a ch- not a chance in hell am I going down there to try to save the tr- you know rest get the get the communicator back when it could lead to all these bad things just let it, let it lie right we haven't moralized a concept like the prime directive like they have in Star Trek you know where it's become part of their moral worldview. So Zachary, my last honorable mention, and I can't imagine I saved this one for last because I just can't imagine any list of essential anything having to do with Star Trek without this on that list somewhere. Not because it's overly philosophical, but just, it's just such a great episode. And are you saying it should be, wait, real quick. Are you saying it should be on any episode? It should be on any list having to do with Star Trek at all, or just, yeah, this really should be on any list list having to do with Star Trek best. That's saying a lot, man. I I can't say, you know, this is right up there for me. This, this episode is right up there with say far beyond the stars. I mean, it's, it's really one of those 
episodes that just should be on every Star Trek list, and that is Carbon Creek. Uh, Not because it's deeply philosophical, although I think there's something really interesting there about narrative and story and history. I mean, she's really, she's telling a story, which I think there's, I think there's something very deep about the way we tell stories and share narratives. And this story that she's telling is really screwing up Archer and Tripp's idea of how history unfolded as it pertains to first contact. She tells a story of her grandmother being marooned on Earth for a period of time, uh, many, many, many years before uh, the actual first contact uh, occurred with Zephram Cochran in the, in the Flight of the Phoenix. So these three Vulcan officers are marooned on Earth, and they're stuck in this little uh, coal mining town. Uh, and you know how they kind of uh, integrated into that town until their their ship came to rescue them. And one of them actually uh, uh, chose to stay. And and again, for me, it's just this idea of story and narrative and history that I thought was kind of interesting philosophically, but on a lighter note, but just, it's just such a brilliant episode and such a well done episode. I, I love it, love it, love it. So I had to get it on my list somehow, some way. Well, I think there's the, there's the deep takeaway about this, which is that history is not as neat and tidy as we sometimes learn it. Right. There are the forgotten stories of history or things that didn't unfold the way they're retold after the fact. And here we get to see, you know, uh, uh, you know, the facts about about humans contact with Vulcans being rewritten in light of a forgotten story. And I find that really fascinating. And, and history is always like that. There are always some stories that survive and some stories that don't. And history is always more subtle and more interesting than than the narrative that we uh, tell about history after the fact, I think. So that's the deep takeaway. And I think that's an important one. We, we forget that history is not as neat and tidy as, as we like to think it is. Um, the, the not so deep takeaway that I really enjoy from this, uh, uh, from this episode is seeing that Vulcans can envy humans sometimes, you know, we don't often see that in Star Trek. Mm-hmm. We see, we see humans kind of maybe en- envying Vulcans for being more logical, more rational. We see Vulcans kind of looking down on humans for being too emotional, but we don't often see Vulcans embracing the chaotic nature of humans. Like, I love that there's a Vulcan that just wants to sit and watch I Love Lucy in this episode. <laughs> like, he's really embraced what it's like to be human. He's like, these people are really nice and it's kind of pleasant here and this is okay. I'm going to watch I Love Lucy now. Why are you worried about all this stuff trying to get home and, mm-hmm. you know, just embrace where you are. This is where we are now and who we are. We might as well try to fit in, you know? Yes. And that's, and that's, and what's interesting is that's logical for the Vulcan. Like, here we are. He's stoic. This is who we are now. We're going to live on this planet maybe for the rest of our lives we might as well embrace it and that is logical from the Vulcan standpoint but you know really deep down inside he just wants to watch I Love Lucy and Zachary we learn something very important as it pertains to our own history and that is that we have to Paul's grandmother to thank for Velcro (laughs) (laughs) Velcro is actually a Vulcan invention so yeah yeah, yeah I, had, actually, I had to put Carby I, I, Creek on my list. Actually, to Paul's grandmother was in Romy and Michelle's high school reunion. She invented post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Zachary, a quick recap, and then we'll we'll go to final thoughts. Um, our essentials list: Dead Stop, Stigma, A Night in Sick Bay, Cogenitor, Marauders, Dawn, The Crossing, Horizon, First Flight minefield and the communicator and that listeners is essential trek philosophy from season two of enterprise and that's a great list and that list right there is why i love season two of enterprise it's a really great list yeah 11 episodes Uh, and again there's so many great episodes in here i mean vanishing point shockwave the seventh i mean there's some really great episodes of Star Trek in here that didn't really make it anywhere on these essentials lists, but they're just great episodes of Star Trek. You just can't go wrong with the second season of, of Enterprise. Well, like I said at the beginning of the show, fundamentally, I don't think this is the deepest season of Star Trek from a philosophy standpoint, but you can't live by bread alone. Sometimes, like the Vulcan inside Carbon Creek, you just want to sit down and watch Star Trek, or I Love Lucy is the case, maybe. <laughs> so... 
Great picks for Essential Trek Philosophy from Season 2 of Enterprise. But this isn't the only thing we've been talking about here on Trek FM this past week, so here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek.fm. Previously on Trek.fm, Standard Orbit. That is part of the Guardian guarding forever, I guess. He does a pretty bad job guarding forever. I mean, my kids just jump right through and ruin history, but... Uh, what, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, that is... <laughs> That is kind of a strange thing that, uh, you know, the Guardian has no gate. The Orb. What's at the heart of jazz? It's improvising. Improvisation is a very, very important part of jazz. And that's what they have to do on DS9. From the moment they stepped on that station, they've had to improvise and find their way and make do with what they have. To the journey! So Janeway knits. She does knit. I wonder when she finds time. Maybe she does it on the bridge when it's quiet. <laughs> she pulls out her knitting bag and her needles and just... <laughs> That's a fabulous mantle. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, Chikata, hand me that bag behind you. I need to knit. Warp 5. I don't know. I think given the, the story, given the, the place in, in, the, in the overall story of Enterprise and everything like that, I mean, they weren't really hardcore into the the killing of people yet you know that didn't come until season three you know and that's what else is happening on trek.fm check out all of these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the star trek universe and beyond you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts if you're an apple user be sure to hit the subscribe button in apple podcasts on the iphone ipad or apple tv or the desktop itunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published and please leave us a star rating and a written review If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and most third-party podcast apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to reach out to us. The best place to join in the larger conversation with us is in the Babel Conference, our listeners-only discussion group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Just choose Message to a Trek FM Show and select Metatrex. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. Well, Mike, when you're not busy trying to decide if your pan-fried catfish is replicated, where can our listeners find you on the Trek FM network and around the interwebs these days? Well, Zachary, I am most active on Facebook. That's where you can find me usually certainly around the Babel Conference. I love talking Star Trek and philosophy with our listeners there. On Twitter, my Twitter handle is at cmichael1701. I'm more active on Twitter than I used to be. Occasionally on Instagram, that's cmichael1701. And if you'd like to read my blog about my journey to publish my novel and a little bit about life, you can catch that at cmichael1701.wordpress.com. And Zachary, when you're not rolling up your sleeves and throwing a few punches, where can our listeners find you around Trek FM and on the interwebs? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek.fm as co-host of To The Journey, Trek FM's dedicated Voyager podcast, along with my two co-hosts there, Kay Shaw and Suzanne Williamson. You can also find me in several recent episodes of The Ready Room, Trek FM's flagship podcast. You can find me on Twitter under the handle at Zachary Fruling, and you can find me on Facebook in the Babel Conference if you'd like to talk about Star Trek and philosophy with me there. Well, if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network through Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and many more, all available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these podcasts each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. Well, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the Metatrex team from around the network. Specifically, we'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek.fm, our two executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Ken Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, our production manager, and Brandon Shea Mutala, our Patreon manager. And a special thank you and a shout out to our two associate producers here for Metatrex. We'd like to thank Patrick Devlin. You can find him under the Twitter handle at MagicDrop5. And my co-host over on To The Journey, who happens to be our associate producer here on Metatrex, Kay Shaw. You can find her under the Twitter handle at Chaco Weeble. 
And don't forget to check out Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. Also check out audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. Well, everyone, thanks for listening to Metatrex, a Star Trek philosophy podcast. Until next time, when we will once again boldly go where no philosophers have gone before. Thank you.